Good morning, Hillcrest Baptist Church and those who are visiting with us. It is again a privilege for me to bring God's word to you. This morning we're going to be looking at God's glory in judgment as and particularly as he brings um, 10 plagues against Egypt as he delivers Israel in the history of, of the Old Testament. The events are found in Exodus chapters 7 to 12 and obviously we can't read all those chapters and so we're going to be focusing just on a much shorter text, Exodus 9 verses 13 to 34. It really just um, describes the seventh plague, the plague of hail. So let's read that together, Exodus 9 verses 13 to 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And yet you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as it had not been in Egypt since the founding, since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be hail in the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb in the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the land, the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field, and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there, that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the was in the head, and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. So Moses went out from out of the city from Pharaoh and spread his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants, so that the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go, for the Lord had spoken 
uh, sorry, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Now God has got a significant problem, if I can say that reverently. God is so immensely powerful, so more powerful than anything in the universe, it is in fact difficult for him to demonstrate his power or to display his power because there is nothing to compete with God. There is nothing in the universe that would, as it were, compete against God and test his strength or in fact draw out his full capabilities. So in order, order for God to display his power, he has done some mighty acts in history. In the Old Testament, there were three big displays of God's power. The first was creation, where God flung millions and billions of stars and planets and galaxies and solar systems into space. Out of nothing, he created this vast universe simply by the word of his command. But there were no people to witness that, that great event and that awesome display of power because Adam and Eve were only created on the sixth day. All we see today is the results of God's creative act. And the second um, great display of God's power was the flood, a worldwide flood, a gigantic global event, an enormous energy and power and destructive force which God sent against humanity. And... Um, with this, this great display of, of power, everybody who saw it died, except for eight people whom God saved in the ark, Noah and his family. And then we come to this third great display of God's power, these ten plagues against the nation of Egypt. God wanted to display his awesome, unrivaled power and his supremacy over the whole world. And so in order to do that, he sent Israel to Egypt, who would, and they would, um, as part of that uh, going into the land and dwelling in the land, they would then become the slaves of the Egyptians. And God, in fact, then raised up Egypt and prospered Egypt and Pharaoh so that they, they became essentially a superpower of the day. And it is this event that we are going to focus on this morning and learn some lessons from it. Now look carefully at the text that we read in Exodus 9 and especially verse 16. It, it says this, But indeed, uh, God speaking to Pharaoh and to the nation of Egypt, But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So God had a particular purpose with these ten plagues, and that was to show his power to the whole world. How was he going to do this? He, in fact, raised up Egypt, and he raised up Pharaoh so that he could display his power against them. It was God who gave Egypt its wealth. It was God who gave Egypt its military might. They, were, they had skills in engineering and in agriculture so that Egypt truly became a superpower of the world and of all the nations Egypt dominated. And God did this so that he could have something to show his great power against. But God wanted to display his power against Egypt um, with ten plagues, not just with a few. And Egypt could not withstand ten plagues. As it were, uh, if you have a boxing match, um, God wanted to go the full ten rounds, and Egypt would not be able to cope with it. So what God did, in addition, the Bible witnesses that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they didn't collapse after the first few plagues, but that they would go, be able to go the full, ten, the full ten rounds, and God could show his power in ten, in ten mighty plagues against Egypt. 
to be sure, Pharaoh was a sinner. God did not make him a sinner. He was a sinner. Uh, Pharaoh made his own choices and the Egyptians made their own choices and they were responsible for their choices. The text also tells us that Pharaoh hardened himself. Uh, we find that in, in our text in verse 17, where God says this to Pharaoh, As yet you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. So God holds Pharaoh accountable. Uh, and the text tells us that Pharaoh hardened himself. And yet the, the, the book of Exodus and even Romans chapter 9 tells us that in that process, it was also God who was hardening Pharaoh so that God could display his power in all of the ten plagues and that they, they wouldn't collapse or throw the towel in after the first few plagues. And so we're going to look at this awesome display of God's power in judgment against Egypt under three headings this morning. The first heading, we're going to look at the authenticity of the ten plagues. The second heading, we're going to look at the impact of the ten plagues. And our third heading is going to be the witness of the ten plagues. So let's go to our first heading, then the authenticity of the ten plagues. So we do have skeptics today. Some of the skeptics deny that the plagues ever happened. Others will acknowledge that some of the plagues did happen, but they just relegate them to natural disasters. After all, don't we have hailstorms today? Don't we have plagues of locusts? And so they just say these were not supernatural judgments of God. They were just some natural events that happened that happened to happen at that time. So what can we say to these skeptics who, who say these things and either deny or downgrade the ten plagues? To those who say that the ten plagues never ever happened, we need to say the following. This position doesn't make sense at all. Something must have happened to Egypt for them to let their labor force go. Egypt used Israel as, as basically a slave labor. So they used, they used Israel for big building projects, for agriculture, and to do all of their manual labor. So Israel was very beneficial for Egypt. Egypt used them and, and used Israel basically to build themselves as a nation. So why would Egypt just let Israel go? Did they just have a change of heart and become kind? Or did they grow a moral conscience against slavery? Not at all. Something must have happened, something dramatic, something powerful must have happened during this time to the nation of Egypt that forced them to let the Israelites go. So it doesn't make sense to say that nothing happened and that the ten plagues are just myth and that they didn't happen at all. Something definitely happened that forced Egypt to let the Israelites go. To those who say that these ten plagues were just natural events, uh, we need to say the following. There are a number of compelling features of the ten plagues that show that they were miraculous, divine judgments um, against the Egyptians. They were not just random, natural events. Just consider two features that we find um, in, in these, these chapters describing the ten plagues. The first feature I just want to mention is that of prediction. These ten plagues weren't just random occurrences that just happened at odd times. God, through Moses and Aaron, predicted when the plague would happen and when the plague would be removed. For example, in Exodus um, chapter 8, verse 32, the plague of the flies, Moses and Aaron tell Pharaoh, tomorrow this will be so. And so they predict when the plague is going to start. In Exodus 8, verses 9 to 10, with the plague of the frogs, Moses even lets Pharaoh choose the time when the plague is going to end. 
And Moses says to Pharaoh, will you say when the plague will end? And that is in fact when I will ask God to end the plague. Just to show Pharaoh that these were not chance, random, natural events that were just occurring in the world. These plagues came directly from God. God had his hand on Egypt. He controlled and he controlled and sent these plagues. He started the, the plague, a particular plague, when he said it would, and he ended the plague when he sent it would. They are controlled and they are divine judgments against Egypt. The second feature we, we also find is that of discrimination. Most of the plagues, almost all of them, were restricted to Egypt. And they did not touch the land of Goshen where, Egypt, where Israel dwelt. So the land of Goshen was within Egypt. Israel dwelt there. And most of the plagues affected the Egyptians and didn't touch Israel at all. So for, for example, in Exodus 9 verses 6 to 7, the plague of the diseased livestock, uh, we read this, and I'm actually going to read that for you. In verses 6 to 7, it says this, so the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of e Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then, then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So we see here that God is in complete control of these plagues and he is able to limit the plagues to a particular geographical area even though they might be intense and so Egypt got the message these were not natural random um, events these were plagues judgments that came from the hand of God and God had full control of them and God was using them to deliver, to deliver Israel from Egypt and to, judge, and to judge Egypt. And so the evidence from history and from our text is that these ten plagues are authentic. They did in fact take place and they were awesome supernatural divine judgments as God delivered Israel from Egypt and crushed Egypt. Our second heading, the impact of the ten plagues. In Exodus 9, verse 16, which we read, God there said that he had a particular purpose with these, ten plague, with these ten plagues, and that was to display his power and make his name known to the whole world. That was God's intent, to spread his glory and his fame to all the nations as he judged this and brought the superpower to its knees. And that in fact did happen. Um, Egypt certainly got the message. In Exodus 7 verse 5, God said that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. In Exodus 18 verse 1, we see that um, the fame of God and what he did to Egypt spread to Midian because we read there that Jethro, um, the priest of Midian, he heard about what God had done to Egypt. Even the other nations that were f much further away from Egypt heard what God had done. For example, in Joshua 9 verse 9, um, some of the, this is some 40 years after um, these plagues um, crushed Egypt, we see that the nations there still said, we heard what God did to the Egyptians. And so the surrounding nations were filled with fear as Israel moved, moved towards the promised land because they saw and they heard how God crushed the Egyptians. And that God, the God of Israel, was with them. And so they feared. We would expect, however, that the biggest impact would have been on Israel themselves 
They saw how God delivered them in the land of Egypt. They saw how these plagues just swept across Egypt and didn't touch them at all. And, and Israel didn't lift a finger to, to help God. God didn't need any help at all. They just stood back and they watched as God brought the superpower to its knees. And so we would have expected that Israel would have walked in the fear of God, that Israel would have walked in obedience and Israel would have walked in confidence because of what God has done or what God did to Egypt. We would have expected that the history of Israel would have been one of living in the light of God's awesome power and doing great things for God. And yet sadly, we see that the history of Israel was the opposite. They were a forgetful nation. They often, so often and so quickly, started fearing anything and everything else apart from God. They walked so often in disobedience and unfaithfulness. They were complaining and murmuring so often um, against God. And God often had to remind Israel not to fear because of what he did to Egypt. And it reminds them of what they did, what he did to Egypt. And I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 7, just a few verses where God speaks to Israel in this regard. Deuteronomy 7, verses 17 to 19 says this. God speaking um, through Moses to Israel. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I. How can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. And so God reminds them, of, of what he did to Egypt because he wanted them to live in the light of the knowledge of the awesome power of God and how he delivered them so that they wouldn't fear the nations around them. And it's absolutely critical that especially for the people of God that, that they are impacted by God's mighty deeds. And so there are lessons for the church as well. We need to remember these 10 plagues and what God did to Egypt. Far too often, we find that Christians in the church are living in fear of, of various things. And they have forgotten the witness and the lessons of these 10 plagues. And so we need to come to our last heading then to make sure that we are living in the light of this awesome display of God's power. Our third and last heading then is the witness of the 10 plagues. Christian, let us not be like Israel. Let us learn lessons from these 10 plagues and let these lessons affect us as, as we live our lives here in the world. And I'm just going to touch on four brief lessons for us as the church. Lesson number one, we need to understand God's absolute power, authority, and control over the natural world. Just consider the plague of hail. This was an immense storm which came on Israel, uh, sorry, on Egypt. Egypt had never experienced a storm like this in all of its history. That hail just destroyed and shattered anything that was in uh, the fields. And not one hailstone dropped in the land of Goshen. Not one. And yet, Israel, yet Egypt felt the brunt of this storm. Consider the, the, the plague of the flies, for example. I wonder how many flies, if we were able to count it, were in the land of Egypt. It was a huge, huge swarm and plague of flies, maybe billions or trillions of flies. Now, as far as I'm aware, flies don't follow a leader. 
or behave um, in, in a herd or a pack type of mentality. It is each fly for himself. So if you are going to control all these flies, you have to do it independently and treat them as individuals. Because while the, the flies went on everything that the Egyptians had, none of them went into the land of Goshen. So God controlled each of the flies. He directed each one of them and he restricted their movements so that they did not go into uh, the land of Goshen, only on the Egyptians. And so all of these plagues give a picture of a God who is in complete control of the natural world. Nothing happens randomly or by chance. Each hailstone, each drop of rain is directed by God. Each insect that flies around, each bird is controlled and under God's sovereignty and power in the natural world. And so that is a very important lesson for us to learn, especially when there's global warming. We do not need to fear. We do not need to fear natural disasters. Doesn't mean that we won't be impacted by them, but as believers, we need to be assured that God is in complete control of this earth and of the natural events that happen around us. The second lesson we need to jump to is God's absolute power, authority, and control over disease. And there are two particular plagues I just want to remind you of. The plague of the boils, which affected both men, um, people, and livestock. And yet, uh, if you remember, Moses and Aaron threw up ash into the sky and that became um, boils on the people. And yet, the people of Israel were unaffected by this plague. It only landed on the Egyptians. The diseased livestock, which we have already seen, only in Egypt, their livestock all died. And the text tells us, that not one of the livestock of Israel died. God has got absolute control over disease. Bacteria, viruses, these are not random events outside of God's control. The cancer that you might have is not an accident. This pandemic that we have of COVID-19 is not an accident. It is not out of control. God is in control of it and is directing it to fulfill his purposes in the world. We are not always sure and we can't always see God's purposes in it. But nothing touches God's children. No disease touches God's children outside of God's sovereign plan and design for his children. Yes, we need to be responsible. We need to take precautions. But never must we live in fear that some disease or random disease or illness or virus is going to take hold of us. Everything is under God's control and nothing is going to touch us, God's children, but by his design and plan for us. And we can trust him in that. And we need not fear during this pandemic or whatever else God may choose to send to the world. The third lesson, God's absolute power, authority, and control over death. And we see this, obviously, in the 10th plague, where at about midnight, death sweeps through Israel silently, and yet death does not touch any of the houses that have been marked by the blood. It only touches um, the Egyptians who earned, whose houses were not covered by blood and in the Egyptian households it didn't touch anyone except the firstborn. And so we see here that God is in complete control of death. Death is directed by God and it comes from God's hand. 
the day that God has chosen for us to die will be the day that we die. Death is in the hands of God and in no one else's hand. It's not random. There is no chance accident that is going to rob you of your life prematurely outside of God's will. We need to be absolutely sure that God is in control of death and that we need not fear death. He directs it and controls it and death will not touch us unless God bids it and sends it and has planned it for us. And we can trust him and we need not live in fear of death, especially with the glorious promises that God has given us through the Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal life that we have in him. But we don't know the day on which we are going to die. But we can be absolutely sure of this. It is the day that God has chosen for us, our children, our parents. It is the day that God has chosen for us to die. And we can rest confident in his power. The last lesson, as we draw to a close, God's absolute power, authority and control over nations, politics and superpower. I wonder what Israel was thinking in the years that were building up to their deliverance because Egypt was oppressing them, was making their slavery very hard and Israel was crying out to God during the years leading up to the plagues and yet Egypt seemed to be prospering. They were getting more and more wealthy. Their military might was in increasing. Their, their prominence as a global superpower was increasing. And so it might have seemed to the Israelites that this is out of control. Has God finally met his match? They might be thinking. Has the superpower of Egypt become too powerful for God because we're crying out to him and we're not being delivered? And what does the text tell us? God's plans and purposes in, in Egypt was that he was in fact raising up Egypt so to be a superpower so that he could show his power in defeating them. It was God that was giving Egypt its wealth and its success as a global superpower. He was raising them up so that he would have something to show his great power against. They weren't a match for God. They weren't out of control. God was in complete control of the political situation, of this nation, their wealth and their growth. And then Israel saw the true state of affairs as God brought these 10 judgments against Egypt. And God hammered them with 10 mighty blows and there was none to save Egypt. And Egypt was crushed and Egypt toppled. God met his match. You must be kidding. God has no rivals. And, and even though... Israel saw Egypt prospering. It was not a sign that somehow it was out of God's control and, and, and that, that, that Egypt was now becoming a true rival of God and the people of God. Not at all. It was God himself who was prospering Egypt so that he could then display his great power in crushing Egypt and setting his people free. And so as the church, sometimes some silly little politician makes some predictions or some threats and the church starts fearing. We don't need to do that at all. We see false religions. Maybe we see Islam spreading across the, the globe, taking over nations. We do not need to fear at all. Yes, we must be aware of what's happening in our world. We must be prayerful. But we must never be fearful. God has no rivals. Take any superpower in the world today and God can crush it easily and quickly if he so wills. Take any, any religion 
any false religion that is spreading in the world, Islam that seems to be taking over some nations. Do we need to fear that? Not at all. God has no rivals. He can deal with any religious group. He can deal with any politician. He can deal with any superpower quickly and easily. He can bring them to their knees just as easily as he brought Egypt to their knees. And so can I close by just asking you as a Christian, are you living in fear? Are you living in fear? Maybe fear for your family, fear during this pandemic, fear of natural disasters, disease, fear of the political situation, um, what's happening globally um, in America, what's happening in the world. If we're living in fear, we have forgotten the lessons from these 10 plagues. God has no rivals. There is no one who can withstand his power, his authority. Our God truly sits on the throne and he reigns. And he calls us to walk with him confidently, trusting in his goodness and his absolute power and control over this world and that everything that happens. Our God truly reigns. And just as God spoke to Israel and told them, do not fear, I am with you. Remember what I did to Egypt. That same message is for us as a church. Trust in the Lord God. He reigns and he has absolute power and control. And we can trust him and we can walk confidently and at peace as believers. God bless you.